In this episode, we'll be talking about design ethics and finding your moral compass. We'll talk about the craft of service design. What is it? And finally, we'll talk about the fragmentation of service design into all kinds of different sub-disciplines. Should we be worried? Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm James, and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you build organizations that put people at the heart of their business. The guest in this episode is the Managing Director of Engine in Dubai. His name is James Samperi. James has been in the service design field for over a decade and he's got a ton of experience. So in this episode, we'll really be talking about what's going on in service design today and what are the th topics you should be concerned about for the next five years. If this is your first time here on this channel, welcome and I'd love to have you to subscribe as we bring new videos at least once a week that help to level up your service design skills. That's all for the introduction and let's quickly jump into the chat with James. Welcome to the show, James. Hi, Mark. Good to see you. Um, we were talking before the interview and we said we met once, I think, in our life ages ago, right? Yeah, so I, from memory, uh, so I think it's probably about 10 years ago in Utrecht. Is that exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah, something like that. Um, and I had, a, I had an interesting taste in shirts and I was, <laughs> I was coming out there um, talking about, I think, doing an intro to Engine and some of the work that we'd been doing with, I think, Mercedes-Benz at the time. So, yeah, a little I, while ago. There, there's one photo that always uh, stuck with me and that is when you showed like an undercover service designer sitting, I think, in an ambulance or something like that. Yeah. Project. Do you know which one I mean? Yeah, that's uh, that's that was one of our service designers at the time, Eric. So mm, yeah, he, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we used to do a lot of work in the um, in the public sector in the UK. So we were, um, we, you know, we were sort of shadowing, shadowing the front line as as is our want. Um, so yeah, that was that was from that uh, project. I think. James, you already mentioned something about engine. For the people who don't know who you are, uh, what do you do these days, and what's your relationship with engine? Yeah, sure. So um, Engine is a um, service design consultancy. So we like to think of sort of one of the one of the first service design uh, entities coming out of the UK. Um, so Engine was set up in 2001 um, by uh, a couple of the founders, Oliver King and Joe Heapy, and they were um, looking to apply their design practice, so originally product designers, to the development and design of services. Um, I came on board with Engine um, 2008, so I've been with Engine um, a few years, um, and currently I'm uh, sort of leading the, uh, the new studio uh, that we've set up in Dubai, so in the Middle East, uh, so since 2017, so we've been out here nearly three years. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. James, um Service design has played an important role in your life, but do you actually remember and can you recall the first time you got in touch with the term? When did you hear about service design and where was it? Um, it was, um, it was. I guess it was very early on in, um, so uh, I, I, was, I was fortunate enough to um, have done a master's at Brunel University, so uh, in design strategy and innovation. Um, I think uh, the focus of that course was really about how do, how do you use design in order to help organizations innovate, mm -hmm. so large, mm -hmm. large organizations. Um, and one of the sort of modules, I guess, within, within that course were the sort of shift from products to services, so the idea of the kind of service economy and certainly Western economies of how you begin to have to kind of reapply your design training to a to effectively a, a new market and set dynamics. Um, I don't think it was necessarily articulated as service design, but it was it was using design for the development of non 
products. So, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of a lot of the time we're looking at development of um, services at the post office. Uh, Orange, who were the, one of the first sort of telcos, who were really very brand driven. Um, and that was also one of the first times that I came across Engine, who were a very sort of weirdy, beardy, um, almost boutique kind of, well, this is a strange idea, you know, two guys setting out and thinking they can design these services and, and building a whole company around right, it. Right, right. So um, that was that was kind of my first intro to it. And then I guess through my days at um, sort of Samsung looking at R&D, I think slowly, weirdly, being at a product company made me realize the importance of services more because a lot of what we were doing was five to ten years in the future. And actually, mm. a lot of the more interesting work we were doing was actually in the design of service rather than it rather than the product so even back then yeah so that was about two that was 2008 hmm. so sort of mid uh, mid 2000s and the dawn of the we, iphone yeah we, yeah we looking, so i guess my my <laughs> i've been talking about 2019 and 2020 for a long time and so uh, <laughs> and now it's here <laughs> now we're here yeah um, and service design is a is a is a credible thing. Hmm. Hmm. James, um, you gave me some really interesting topics. I know I say that uh, in every episode, but it's <laughs> it's true. Um, so I'm going to pick your brain about these uh, these topics. Are you ready uh, to do some interview jazz? I think so. Yeah. All right. Drum roll or bass drum or I don't know. Uh, topic number one. Is okay. called design okay. uh, ethics. We haven't okay. talked about ethics a lot. So, do you have a question starter and can you show it to us? So, it's going to come in, uh, come in over here. <laughs> now, this way. Um, so, why design ethics? Um, so, there's a number of conversations I think that we're, we're sort of having um, here at Engine. I think design ethics is something that is becoming uh, more and more important for us when we're thinking about not only the kind of work we do, but also who we work with. And I think it's becoming increasingly important as um, sort of markets evolve and we're seeing a number of different sort of trends in the market. So things that we encounter a lot of the time are, you know, this idea of big data, the idea of personal data within the fabric of of a service. Um, also about the sort of treatment of people who uh, work on the front line of a, of a particular service, but also elements around, um, you know, how how sustainable a service is, you know, what impact does it have on our planet? Um, so certainly three, three big areas that we're sort of encountering, you know, quite a lot in our work. Um, so let, let's re- rewind for a second. Like yeah. what is what is sort of uh, increasing this awareness re- related to design ethics? What is driving this? Um, I think it's the um, I think we're dealing with we're dealing with organisations who are looking for a I guess a suite of outcomes. Mm-hmm. So those outcomes might be hey how you know how do we how do we not only um, serve these people uh, better, but as a by- byproduct or as a, as a primary driver, therefore, how do we keep those people for longer? Um, so therefore, how do we earn more money from our existing customer mm-hmm, base? Mm-hmm. Um, how do we attract more customers? Um, and then how do we, in ever increasing marketplaces, how do we sort of improve things like margins? Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. how do we balance out um, some of the operational costs with um, you know what we're earn- what we're earning from from the service. So I think why that's important to um, us as service designers is a lot of what we're developing and doing. So whether that be okay, so we're developing a service that drives a number of different outcomes. So so we have to track back from saying okay, so how do we how do we maintain a focus not only on what's great for the customer, but how do we make it so it's a justifiable um, investment for an organization? Mm-hmm. Uh, and how do you strike the right balance so actually you don't tip into um, 
doing something that makes a lot of sense to the organization, but actually compromises a lot of the things that um, either customers value or you value as an individual, um, like privacy, mm. for instance. Mm. And I think we've seen a lot of sort of service companies come unstuck because their ethics haven't matched their um, their desire to innovate or their desire to, to create interesting services. So, you know, guys that spring to mind are, you know, anyone anyone who has a business that relies on the gig economy. So if you think about Deliveroo, if you think about right, Uber, right, 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 you know, Frontline don't get access to healthcare. Um, they don't. They're not. They don't get full uh, full time employee status. And we're mm-hmm, seeing that, mm-hmm. you know, uh, go through the courts at the moment in California. But all of that, I think, is something we as designers need to be cognizant of, um, because we need to ensure that. I always feel like we are should be a moral compass. So whether. Within our, whether we work in house in our clients or whether we're sort of consulting to a client from an agency, I think our point of view is to try and strike the balance. And I think the, the art and science of great service design is something that can strike the balance. And, and I think ethics is, is a core cool part of that. Mm. So <clears throat> I see there are discussion about ethics coming up more and more, and it, it makes a lot of sense. And like you said, the moral compass. Um, it hasn't been discussed uh, a lot in the last 10 years, I think. Um, like, wh- what are the questions, if people are sort of intrigued by this topic, what kind of questions should they ask themselves to help them develop their or discover their moral compass? I think it's... Um, so we, 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 have a, we have a sort of... Um, a thing that we do from the outset, which is, which is just trying to understand where the organizational value is. If we get this thing right, so you know, what does look, what does good look like at the end of this? Right. If we get this right for a customer, what are the thing, what are the elements that we would be delivering? So they can be quite, um, quite um, tactical. So they can be things like, well, I, you know, I'm able to personalize my service, and actually, it, it evolves mm-hmm. as my business mm-hmm. evolves. Or they can be quite, um, or they can be quite sort of um, broad. Like this thing is just easier. It's just say this just saves me time. And then we also do the same thing for the organisation. Mm-hmm. So actually, when we're designing this service for the organisation, when you inwardly point that service, what's the value? What value does it create for the organisation? Um, now, one of those things, you know, there's going to be a lot of sort of. Uh, sweet spots in there. So where you where where a thing is equally valuable for an organisation is is for a customer. That is a that's that classic thing that people say. Right, this is a this is a win win. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know? So for me, that they're the things that becomes the some of the fabric of what you're trying to sort of use to design uh, with it within the service design uh, within the service that you're designing. Um, where there's a I think often when you go through that exercise, there'll be some contradictions. So there'll be things like, you know, from a customer point of view, I value my privacy. From an organizational view is I want to get as much data on these people as possible and I want to be able to do X with it. And I think there they are the points where you, you need to identify those early because you need to then design a effectively a compromise system or a way that actually talks to both those things, but without compromise, without valuing one over the other. And I Mm. think our responsibility as being the conduit between the customer and the organization is to represent those two views. Right, because it makes the the situations where uh, value is created on both sides where there isn't um, uh, a trade-off, that's great. But as soon as uh, a trade-off has to be made. You have to have like uh, a framework to make decisions. Yeah. Right. And and what's yeah. that framework? Right. That's that could be a moral framework. Yeah. 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 And I th- I think what we're increasing. So something that we're doing at Engine at the moment is creating a manifesto. Hmm. So we're creating an internal manifesto, which effectively. Um, supports all of our designers in the studio identify what we believe as engine to be the right thing to do right 
Um, you know, and some of those things are a response to things that we see coming down the road. So, for instance, you know, there was a big, there's been a big um, emphasis from organisations in order to find operational efficiencies is to move from people sitting in call centres to chat box. Because that, we, you can create a simulated mm-hmm. uh, person, personalised conversation with a chat box. And actually, functionally, that that's great. But what are the ethics that sit behind that? You know, should should you um, should you as a per, uh, as a customer know that you're talking to a effectively a robot rather than a person? And what are mm-hmm, the implications? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, what mm-hmm. implications to do that? Mm-hmm. So um, I guess the, the the manifesto is a key set of um, guidelines for our designers that we can use across the entirety of our projects to mm. kind of say. This is this is this is where our moral code sits. Exactly. So if we're outside of this, we know we know that actually we can flag begin to start flagging those things. Hmm. And uh, a thing like the manifesto, and then we'll move on to the next topic. But um, I think it's good if people start thinking about their own manifesto. And the 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 challenge would be like you have to know what to put in your manifesto. I think that's also one of the the, the key challenges but that that requires some reflection yeah and it's hard it's hard right yeah. because you know when you dig down into any organization you know if you work for a, a you know a, a series of big blue chip chip organizations or even you know smaller organizations there's going to be stuff there that you perhaps you know don't agree with or you don't like so actually getting the balance right is is mm. tricky and it's you know you It'd, it'd be a miss of me if we're saying, you know, we're going to turn away anyone who doesn't have the same moral code as us. But I think what we're trying to do is to ensure that whatever we touch feels right, right, and for the right reasons. Good. Okay. The design ethics. We'll be talking about that more, I'm sure, in the coming uh, episodes. Uh, ready to move on to topic number two? Yep. All right. Let's do it. Um, there we go. It's called Design Crafts, and I just could have probably removed Design. Do you have a question starter? Um, how can we? Yeah. How can we? Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> um, how can we, um, I guess get into a conversation about design craft in terms of what that means for service design. So, so I think, um, so as I'm an avid, uh, viewer of the service design show, I know that you've talked, (laughs) I know that you've talked about, uh, craft the odd, the odd time. Whenever I've seen craft being discussed, it's sort of at the level of methodology. Yeah. Um, I think when I'm talking about design craft here, I'm talking about um, something slightly different. So if I just sort of explain what I mean. Go ahead. Um, So I think, um, you know, what we've seen is, I think, a sort of maturity of of service design practice. So, you know, in the early days, um, lots of people were sort of explaining I remember really early on at Engine, yeah, even when I joined in, in the mid-noughties, we were sort of just going into client organization and we were saying, this is a service. Like, this is what it's made up of. People, processes, systems, products, places, propositions, and you can design these things. Mm-hmm. We don't need to do that anymore. Um, the, next, the next sort of phase of evolution, I guess, or maturity were people going, yeah, I get that actually what a service is and the thing can be designed. Um, and then it became about methodology. So I think what we um, what we were seeing is that all of a sudden service design became a credible alternative way to solving a organizational problem where they perhaps gone to a management consultancy or a brand consultancy or something else. And they effectively said, look, we've used their process before. We want to see what your process is so mm-hmm. we can sort of mm-hmm. compare the two things and to a certain extent feel okay around, okay, we're going to opt for this methodology. By the way, I, rem- I must remind myself that I, in all of these things, I have to recommend a bunch of books. So there's a great book, old now, Strategy Safari. Um, we'll link to it down below. Yeah. Um, 
and I can't remember the author, but it's called Strategy Safari, but it talks about how you can solve problems from different schools of thought, and they mm. talk about the design school, the management school, the economic school. So actually, what our clients were doing were p- picking someone from the design school to solve a, a problem, which mm-hmm. wasn't necessarily a design problem. I think where we've evolved since then is that we have a methodology and a robust way of working through things and a way of engaging uh, a client in, the, in that uh, transformation. And I think where the conversation should be now is around, okay, so you've got service design, but how do we know it's good service design? Uh-huh, yeah. How do we know that actually what you're designing is a, is a good or you know, ideally great service? So I guess what we've been putting a lot of sort of emphasis um, into at the moment is trying to understand what that means. So we don't, I don't think in the community there's the language to talk about what great service design looks and feels like. So we was, you know, a question we've got on our studio wall is, you know, what is the aesthetic of the service that you're designing? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that seems like a sort of counterintuitive thing to ask of something that might be inherently invisible. Mm-hmm. Um, but when we talk about aesthetic in service, we're talking about, you know, how does how do you retain a consistent sort of brand brand experience through mm-hmm. the whole thing? Do you create those micro moments of delight? How do you design the interactions, the communications? How do you design the policy that sits underneath? How do you support the decision making that underpins a lot of those policies? So for us, we're starting to shape what we think the lexicon is underneath the aesthetic of service design and and what what we believe good looks like. And <clears throat> aren't there so many moving parts in a service that make what that makes it uh, super complex and hard to actually grasp what the craft is, or are you finding really foundational patterns? Well, I think I think we have to get, so another combination I think but embedded within this question is, I think we have to get specific about the role that we play as service designers within, with like what we bring to the table as service designers for mm-hmm. the, for the uh, some of these problems. I think the clue is kind of in the title in that what we're, to- what we're all talking about is a deep understanding of services, how they work, how they operate, how they're delivered, plus design, right? Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, we're strong believers that anyone can be involved in the design, anyone can design a service, but actually it's designers who are uniquely in- uniquely placed to be able to craft a, a service and, and, a, and an experience and then understand what it requires in order to kind of make that thing work. And I think we need to understand as designers that we don't need to affect the entire organization because I think there's lots of there's lots of conversation at the moment of you need to, you know, in order to be a best service company, you need to radically transform you know, an organization Mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. thousand people in order to kind of deliver this service. I think in our experience, it's about knowing where to start. It's about demonstrating that parts of an organization and parts of an operation can be changed and understanding that actually what you need to be able to do is to design the interface between the service and the experience as users or customers experience it with how the organizational uh, how the organization operates it and demonstrate how that can work and that can be on a small scale or that can be at a transformational scale but i think the key thing and the key thing that designers have is the ability to sit between a number of disciplines to talk multiple languages and then pull that thing together and not lose the essence of what we were talking about right at the beginning which is that sweet spot between okay mr jones mr ahmed this is super valuable for you, an organization. This ticks all of your boxes, because that's that's the art and science of it. I think. Hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> it's it, it's it's um, it, it's sort of important to to uh, simplify what we actually do. Like uh, that's probably Einstein who said it. In order to you know, it's probably the Bono who said it. Like simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. If you can explain. 
yeah. it's simply like we are we are good at understanding the problem we are good at ideating solutions we are also good at actually creating it making it bringing it to life yeah so, and i think i think one common theme throughout all of your previous interviews was how do we how do we get stuff off the wall or you know exactly. off yeah easy yeah. um and i think it's um I think for us, it's getting specific around skills and experience. Mm. And I think one of the things that is talked about in a very generic sense is designers need business skills or designers need business acumen or how, how uh, businesses work. I think that's true, but I think how far do you go, right? We would never expect a management consultancy to have two degrees in detailed design right. to be able to understand the world. So where is where are the overlaps? And I think the overlaps, and for us the overlaps, have been understanding how design strategy interfaces with business strategy. So understanding how you begin to feed that into decision-making processes. I think it's understanding how a service operation is delivered at the point of interface. And I think it's understanding how you reorganize yourself through a transformation program to achieve the design that you want that you've conceived of hmm. so i think if you're talking about business skills i'd like to talk about business strategy and design strategy um transformation plans and i'd like to talk about operational interface exactly <clears throat> I, I'm already visualizing a picture in my head, like the, the three steps that we talked about. And then there's a sphere around it where we need to interface with the, I don't know if this, the, these areas that you just mentioned, right? There's a great book. Yes, there's a great book called, published in 1990 called The Design Dimension by Lorenz. He was one of the first management consultancies to talk about design in the context of business. Hmm. And he basically has a, a sort of artwork of a, uh, a steam engine and it's got the sort of um, the pistons of a steam engine and design is the central piston that uh -huh. drives, drives the wheels. But he sort of says design is always a thing that has sat between technology, marketing, um, I think it's technology and marketing, yeah, yeah, yeah. but in a service organization that sits between operations, that sits between strategy, it's the same. Um, mm. But I just need to contextualize what our business acumen means in more specific terms. And for us, it means those three things. Awesome. I'll, I'll, make, I'll, I'll draw the image and uh, post it on LinkedIn or something like that uh, and, uh, and uh, get your response. Let's continue the conversation yeah. over there. James, final topic. Uh, ready? <clears throat> yeah. Fragmentation and integration. Okay, I'm going to go for a how, how can we. Mm. So, um, you know, it's, I'd say the last sort of five, six years, I mean, have been a really interesting time for uh, service design. We've seen the um, sort of uh, the, the blowing up of design thinking, mm -hmm. which is sort of in a parallel track. Um, but we've also seen very tangible evidence that design is seen as a very valuable thing. And why have we seen that? We've seen... Lots of large organizations take, you know, build big design capabilities in-house. So we think about IBM, we think about um, Capital One. Um, we also think about um, the acquisitions that some of the management consultancies have made. So we look at Accenture, we look at um, Accenture and Fjord, we look at EY McKinsey, and Serin. Yeah. We look at, um, yeah, McKinsey and Luna. Um, and I think what's interesting, you know, from my perspective, looking, looking at, from the outside in to that is I think two things are happening at the same time. So I think, um, again, with the, with the maturity of service design, I don't think we're seeing um, a natural, we're not seeing all service design companies follow the same natural curve. And I think it's when, mar when sort of uh, disciplines get more sophisticated, the market itself gets more sophisticated by its very nature. So that brings me to one, the first point, which is about fragmentation. So how do we understand that service design companies can have, can be more fragmented in what they offer? So if I look at some of the acquisitions that, um, say, Accenture have made, 
a lot of the, the their version of service design is a very digital version of service design. So, you know, for their perspective is service design is a way of effectively helping an organization move through digital transformation. And we can go further with you because we have these guys with these great design skills who can be able to kind of conceive of what that digital service mm-hmm. looks like. Now, that's one flavor or one brand of service design. Um, you know, there are there are others. There are ones which are predominantly around um, capability build. So what we see is um, we see the guys going in and building service design. So services, the guys who are doing service design doing, um, you know, they're going in building capabilities, helping the organization help themselves, all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. And then there's, an, you know, I would say we're in a slightly different engine for, all, you know, your international uh, viewers. Uh, I would say engine is, is uh, very much like a multi-channel, omni-channel agency. You know, we, we, we uh, are as comfortable in, the, in physical as we are in digital, mm-hmm, and it's about... Mm-hmm. Where our strength is is understanding the juxtaposition between those various various things, um, and I think the the likes of you know IDOs etc. have always sort of talked you know done work in that space as well. So I think um, one of the things I guess one of the how might we is is um, clients who are buying service design um, might be uh, you know how do we, how do we help them understand. Um, our version of that? How do we better articulate our version of service design? And how do we support them to buy service design in a more informed and sensible way? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we have like a, the equivalent of a service design phone book. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. But I think it's an interesting, you know, it's, it's been an interesting exercise in sort of saying, um, how do you perceive this, client? Because obviously, um, you know, we've we've been in conversations where they where they obviously don't quite know how to buy service design because mm-hmm. they kind of go, here's someone who's just, you know, developing digital. Here's someone who's doing everything. Here's a management consultancy who do you know talk about design thinking, and here's actually a research agency. So that is quite a complex um, purchase process from a from a client's perspective. So how do we ease that? I mean, I don't have the. I mean, we we have some ideas of how we can support that, but I think as an industry, it's an interesting question. Like, should we celebrate the diversity that we're now seeing within within service design, rather than try and cluster everything together? <clears throat> I'm 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 thinking about other fields that have that might have gone through the same challenge, and uh, the first field that comes to mind is like the. The digital, the web design field, uh, the interaction design, UX design, like everything uh, is put up on a big pile. And do we need to start applying and developing, again, an an additional vocabulary, like adding adjectives to service design training or service design research agency or digital service design agency? Uh, Is that the way forward? Um, maybe, um, I guess the way I always imagine it is I, I think it, a lot of it starts with design and management education. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that you might do sort of specialist modules in various versions of design execution. Uh Um, I think there's no coincidence, for example, that a lot of the guys at engine, um, we have a real split between perhaps people from a digital background, but also people from a um, product design background. Because mm-hmm. we find actually it's those guys who are used to working with manufacturers and designing stuff for, to build it. Yeah. Sort of almost have the the inherent training to kind of go, okay, no, I get this. I know, I know that I have to go and speak to HR and talk about their uh, people onboarding process because that's part of what we need to deliver on the front line. So... I can see it manifesting itself in design education, um, and I can also see it perhaps manifesting in um, public bodies. So the way the way that um, you know, say it's the service design network, 
you know, does the service design network have a different way, you know, because they're often a bit like the design council did previously. Like, how do we help people navigate the design industry and buy mm-hmm. in the right way? Mm-hmm. That would be something that they could they could su- support clients, clients with. Um, and I think as we get better as agencies and, and it's less of a problem, I guess, in-house because um, – Although, you know, I'd be happy to hear from people if, if they think they've, they've experienced these problems as well. But certainly from an agency perspective, if you've only worked with a, if you're a bank and you've only worked with a digital service design agency, that's your view of service design. Perhaps you don't think that you need to integrate your brand and your people training within that project. Mm, mm, mm. There isn't it. There's, there's, there's a. There's an education piece within agency, but I'm not quite sure what that looks like. We we need a service design map, like and and, and yeah. <laughs> where in, in, on which island are you, and what's 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 more out there in in this land, on yeah, this yeah. planet, and, and <laughs> sort of how and sort of how far you can how far each entity can allow you to allow you to go, because mm. I think that's. That's the other thing, right? Sometimes you just need to bring someone in who's just going to help you work out what the proposition is and, I, you know, come up with some big ideas and develop that vision that the whole organization can mm. rally around. We talk about that in our book. Um, so, uh, but sometimes you just need help and support with, okay, how on earth do we get this thing over the line and implemented? Now, in order to be an end-to-end service design agency, you would need to be massive mm. because of the of problems so another solution to that might be can can an old model work of you have these discrete separate service design companies or do you need more of a networked approach that you can bring different disciplines in and out of that network and it's based around solving the problem um, and some str- uh, st- sort of strategy organizations do that where they kind of you know, bring in a, have a loose, a loose sort of collection of people that they bring in around the problem. Mm -hmm. Um, But then you lose things like, you know, the design ethics that we talked about before, or the methodology or the approach. So this kind of fragmentation issue is a challenge. It it, it should be part of the conversation. Mm. And being loosely tied together, that's what, (laughs) right? Yeah, these kind of... um, uh, sort of bungee cords, bungee you know, this, cord. kind of, this kind of membrane hmm. where you can flex in and out and, and change the shape. <clears throat> you already hinted upon something, and uh, this is your opportunity to make it, to formalize it. Like, is there a question that you'd like ask the listeners and the viewers of the show to think about and to comment upon? Um, I think. Um, I think a big question that we're dealing with, a big question that's on my mind at the moment is in a world where design is being seen as valuable to businesses and an inherent part of how an organization remains successful and competitive, how do we retain what made design special in the first place? Okay. Well, we'll think about that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, let's comment down below if you're listening to the podcast. Head over to the YouTube page and uh, comment down there. James, uh, we're going to wrap this one up. I want to thank you so much for your time. I'm sure uh, we could continue for quite a long time. I'll uh, I'll try to post some um, uh, posts on LinkedIn to continue the conversation and there and let people join in. Let's do an experiment with that. Thanks thanks again, man. Cheers, Mark. Appreciate it. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks. So what's your take on James' question? How can we make sure that service design doesn't lose the thing that made it so valuable in the first place? Leave your comments down below and remember your comment might just be the thing that gives someone else his big breakthrough insight. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to grab the link and share it with one other person today who might find it interesting as well. Thanks so much for watching and I look forward to see you in the next video.